What's up, Ticket 230? I hope everyone's having a great day. Welcome to this year's E3 special. Joining me like last year is Alex, previously known as Squawker last year. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's been a great summer of discovering some great games, and now let us greatly discuss them in a manner that will ensue greatness. Let's do, <laughs> let's do it. Okay, so we're going to talk about our top five games, and uh, let's get the show on the road. So since you are my guest, I'll let you start off with your number five. Okay, so coming in at number five for me is Halo Infinite. Slated to be released on holiday 2020. It's the latest in the new trilogy of Halo games being developed by 343, following on from the um, not-so-good game that was Halo 5, but it's coming to a greater variety of platforms now, actually. It's coming to the PC, which is great for PC gamers, and it's coming to the so-called Project Scarlet or whatever Space Age weird Xbox they're developing at Microsoft. Halo 5, or, well, Infinite, sorry, uh, it's coming with a brand new engine, the Slip Space Engine, which will go in bold new directions with great graphics. We've got a teaser trailer so far, which hasn't really told us a lot, but it's looking good. Looks like Master Chief's going to discover yet another Halo ring, but those of you who have been playing the new trilogy know that Halo rings have been mysteriously absent in the game. But going from Halo 6 to Tengu's number 5 game, what is your pick, Tengu? All right, so for my number five, I picked Rainbow Six Quarantine. And, uh, you know, when Rainbow Six Siege first came out and it turned yeah. out to be mostly geared toward PvP, I was a bit let down, especially when Ubisoft scrapped Rainbow Six Patriots. And I was looking forward to a co-op campaign-driven game. And while it was still really fun with my friends in Terrorist Hunt and Rainbow Six Siege, it just didn't feel the same like in the two Rainbow Six Vegas games. So when Quarantine was announced, based off the limited time event outbreak for Rainbow Six Siege, like my ears kind of perked up a bit. And the creators said they wanted to make this co-op only venture as awesome as Siege's PvP. And I'll admit, I never played Outbreak since I had Siege uninstalled at the time. So the virus situation with infected creatures, I still find that a bit weird. With Rainbow's a bit like their more grounded reality. But I guess at the end of all things, like, fun gameplay is fun gameplay. And from what I read, Outbreak was really fun. So I'm looking forward to see how this idea can be expanded. All right, so going up the list, what's your number four? Coming in at number four, it's a game that's being developed, rebuilt, remade by THQ Nordic. It is the Destroy All Humans remake. It is a classic game from the year 2005 in which you played the alien Cryptosporidium 137 and you would go to 1950s America, destroy all the humans, harvest the brain stems, play as a president and uh, defeat the evil government agency in a really good game that had fantastic humor, classic destruction. It was it was literally playing a B-movie for game. And now THQ Nordic are rebuilding the entire game from the ground up, porting it to new consoles, including the PC, and it's slated to come out in 2020. At E3, we saw some uh, pre-alpha gameplay, and from what I've seen on of it, it looks okay. It's clearly not ready yet. There's a lot left to do. The gameplay looked a bit too smooth in a way, which sounds really hypocritical, but... <laughs> It looked like it just hadn't quite made it yet. It didn't feel realistic. Um, so, but they're not only remaking it, they're also putting in some improvements. Like they're making the mobility of the crypto better with jet skating, which looks really cool actually. And uh, while I'm pretty picky on my remakes, I kind of like them just to be as we true to the original as possible. Um, I like it because, to be honest, mobility in Destroy All Humans was absolutely rubbish. Um, only thing I'm really not too keen on is the art style. I think it just looks a bit too um, cartoony in a way, but it's still in pre-alpha, so there's time to develop, time to grow. And to be honest, uh, you know, if they perfect it, then I'm fully on board. Um, I'd love to play Destroy Humans again. I mean, I could at any time on my PS2, but to have it on my PC, fully scaled up, fully improved, what's not to love? Um, but what do you have at number four, Mr. Tengu? 
All right, Mr. Alex. Uh, my number four is Vampire of the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. And for me personally, I came late to the Vampire of the Masquerade Bloodlines party. And uh, what piqued my interest for the game, though, at the time, was this video of the Ocean House Hotel. And, you know, as an aside, I, uh, I built this computer, the one I'm using right now back in 2010, so I was looking for games to play. But anyway, uh, inside uh, this hotel was pure horror. Ghostly figures moving through hallways, construction vehicles moving without warning, pots and pans flying off shelves. It was great. And from there, I decided to give Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines a shot. And I promptly updated the game with the fan patches, and I went to town, and I was impressed with what I played, and I really felt like it was ahead of its time. And I remember reading the IP kept changing hands throughout the years, so we really didn't know who owned it or if a sequel will ever be in the works. But as we found out earlier this year, before E3, Hardsuit Labs will be working on the sequel, and it's being published by Paradox Interactive, and they have a lot to live up to. But based on the early gameplay footage, I've only seen a little bit of it. It looks like they're well on their way to providing a lot of play styles and interesting dialogue choices. Like, when I see it, personally, it's no mistaking that it's a Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines game. Alright, so, we're reaching the peak. What is your number three, good sir? Sitting in the middle of my list is Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. It is the first big, major, single-player Star Wars game since the Force Unleashed games, and it's being developed by Respawn. The game itself is set between the prequel films and the uh, original trilogy, so it's after Order 66 was executed by Shiva Senate Palpatine, and before Luke Skywalker went and blew up the, um, the big ball thing. <laughs> now... It's um, looking like a pretty alright game, um, and I think the reason why I've sat it in the middle of my list was just because it was quite average in a way. Um, the gameplay does look quite fluid, though. The lightsaber combat looks pretty cool. You've got your force abilities, you've got your little droid companion. Looks like a pretty decent single player game set in what is, you know, a very rich universe. The Star Wars universe is so much bigger than just the films. If you watched any of the TV shows, read any of the comics, there's a lot of great stuff in there and I hope that stuff is captured within this game, um, but we don't know a great deal about, about it still, so I think we're still going to be waiting on for more details to come out. Gameplay, oh wait, I've already said that. Um, but yeah, it, it just looks like a pretty decent title really, it's uh, going to be released on the Origin Store since it's under EA and I assume it's coming to all the major consoles as well. Um, so, if you want to pick it up, it's coming out on November 15th, 2019. I will probably be picking it up at that time as well, but at the same time, I just want to see what more comes out. I'm just still on the fence a little bit. The uh, demos just looked a bit scripted in a way, which I know sounds daft because obviously at E3, you gotta, you got to show off your big guns, but... Um, I don't know, but then again, EA, they're the bloody slick marketing machine that they are, so, yeah. But, number three is still a good spot, it's still a spot of prestige, even if I'm just trying to talk down my number three pick, so <laughs> hopefully Tengu can uh, talk up his number three spot with, well, what is it? Well, number three for me is Watch Dogs Legion. So uh, when the rumors surfaced when or that Watch Dogs Legion would have you play as any NPC in the world, I was like, hold on. It's like, where's my boy Marcus Holloway from Watch Dogs 2? And, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, how is this going to work, like via storytelling? So I needed to see it. And Ubisoft showcased a pretty lengthy gameplay demo, and I came away feeling a bit better about it. And it also made me think, this must have been a bitch to code. And... You pretty much recruit agents, up to 20, if I remember correctly, out of a pool of, well, just everyone in the game. Like, each having their own dialogue, personalities, gameplay perks, and you'll see whoever you choose in the story cutscenes. And I think that's nuts. Um, I'm excited about that because everyone who plays will have their own roster of DedSec individuals, which is cool. But how far does it go, is my question. It's like, will it change mission outcomes based on who you choose? I didn't really research that far, and there's also the added feature of permadeath. And that could also impact things hard if you really enjoyed playing as a certain character. In the end, I like how they change things up, building a resistance in an authoritarian London. And lastly, some of that action was pretty sweet, especially the John Wick-style 
close range gun battles. So hopefully it ends up being pretty good. All right, so my number three is done. We are in our top two now. So what's next on your list? 100 years ago, the Americans decided they didn't like beer anymore or alcohol. So they brought in this cool little thing called Prohibition, which banned beer, but also made the Mafia become a big thing. And while those days are now gone, the dudes in the trench coats with the Tommy guns and the cool Italian accents and all that, you can still relive those days with Empire of Sin, developed by the one and only John Romero, the man who made all those lovely FPSs in the 1990s, became a rock star. Fudged it a little bit with Dai Katana, but he's back, he's on his game, and it just looks brilliant! Oh, but that's just because I'm a history buff and I like XCOM stuff. Yes, in Empire of Sin, you are building your Mafia family in 1920 Chicago. You are going to take place in some XCOM style combat as you guide your thugs, your henchmen, your whatever you want to call them into uh, street battles against rival families, build your family with characters who could betray you, who have their agendas, who want to help you while you're building your network of speakeasies and casinos throughout the city, and there are multiple ways to become the top dog of Chicago. You could do it through social influence, violence, or notoriety, and while I'm still on a massive high from playing Total War Three Kingdoms, getting burned by its character system as I recently just had one of my big generals betray me a bit, but then I just did it right back to the faction anyway with my general who I'd implanted as a spy. I want to see this kind of stuff in Empire of Sin. I'm, I, I'm really loving character-based empire builders just because you never know who you can trust. Your big boy could be your big betrayer or he could be the person who gets you right up to the top. So I'm just looking forward to this because... I just love Mafia games. I used to play a really little cool real-time strategy game about them called Gangsters 2. If you remember that, then you're brilliant. And basically, it's that again, but it's going to be at its full potential with, once again, John Bloody Romero, his lovely wife, and his amazing team. But there is another number two on the block, and it is being presented by Tengu for 230... YouTube man, so what is it? <laughs> okay, thanks for that segue, dude. Uh, well, it's another Ubisoft game, and uh, this time it's Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Uh, so in my mind, like, how would Ubisoft evolve the Ghost Recon franchise from Ghost Recon Wildlands? And the top two features they added, along with some quality of life stuff, like takedowns from prone position, finally, uh, would be adding survival aspects and an injury system. So you're in this big bad world being hunted, and what better way to make it even more tense is making sure your character is in tip-top shape. So from what I've been reading, um, eating and drinking give you buffs, so you aren't really bogged down by any negatives of survival gameplay. Um, and in the bivouac, which is essentially a camp that the characters can set up, you can craft, you can treat your injuries, inspect weapons, and by inspecting weapons you'll get a small buff to accuracy. And also, going back to the injury system, it's like an evolution of it from the original Ghost Recon back in, I think it was like 2001, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I remember then, if you got shot in the leg or something, you'd move a lot slower. And it's cool to see this system return. And you can lose accuracy if you get shot in the arm. You gotta tend to injuries while in cover to get back in the fight. If you're down for the count, teammates can carry you out of harm's way. And I think it adds a new dynamic to each engagement along with being able to blend into the terrain while prone for hiding and or ambushes. There are also new enemy types to look out for, like the Rocket Gunner, Breacher, and Heavy, which should make firefights more interesting by targeting certain threats. And I don't have to wait next year for it, like a lot of other games. So, uh, alright man, this is it. Our top most anticipated game of this year's E3 2019. Alex, buddy, what is your number one? 20 years ago, an absolutely brilliant game came out, and at that time, I was only three years old, and I had just started gaming, or at least started sitting on my dad's knee while he games, but I got to play with the keyboard so I could help, but he had this great game. These little men were on the screen, running about, slashing with swords, setting the castles on fire, 
and he was building villages and kingdoms and all the stuff in medieval lands. And then I started getting older and I was like, Dad, I want to play Little Men. I want to play Little Men. And he says, it's not called that, son. It's called Age of Empires 2, The Age of Kings. And 20 years have passed. I still love the game. The game's still going strong. The community is as big as ever, as amazing as ever. With your pros, your casuals, your people who are like me, who are intermediate at the game. Yeah, I never got pro. But now, Forgotten Empires, the amazing team who not only kicked this game back into the mainstream, they brought us the amazing recent expansions of the Forgotten Empires, the African Kingdoms of Rise of the Rages, the extended edition of uh, Age of Mythology and the Tale of the Dragon expansion for Age of Mythology. We are now getting Age of Empires 2, the definitive edition. Slated to release in the autumn of 2019, it is going to completely redo the graphics up to a standard similar to the Age of Empires 1 Definitive Edition. It is going to rebalance gameplay, bring in a whole bunch of new tweaks to try and make the game more efficient, try and get rid of all those little niggles and annoyances that we've started noticing over the 20 year lifespan of the game. Four new civilizations, the Lithuanians, the Cumans, the Bulgarians and the Tartars as we have another gander at Eastern Europe again like we did in the Forgotten. but. This time a closer gander and looking at the later Mongolian periods with a lovely new campaign called The Last Tartars, which we don't know too much about yet, but the game is due to go into a beta very, very soon. There is still a chance for you to sign up if you want to take part in it. I'm going to do my best to try and get myself a little space there. Um, and yeah, my hopes are very high. I am praying and praying and praying this does not get messed up. This does not get fluffed up stays quite true to the original. I haven't really been vocal about it because, like I said, you know, last year I was Squawker, this year I'm Alex's game library and I'm still quite new in being Alex's games library, so I haven't really established my character, my persona, or, you know, no one really knows what I really love and what I really hate. <laughs> but um, I did not like Age of Empires 1 Definitive for a number of reasons. One, the Microsoft Store exclusivity. I hate using Microsoft Store. It's an absolute load of trash. Um, a lot of gameplay tweaks just rub me the wrong way. I think, but I think that's just because I've grown to love Age of Empires one's shortcomings. But a Age of Empires two kind of has has it all. It doesn't really necessarily need improving, but there are ways it could be made better in, like you know, just tuning up, tightening up, tweaking it up, and that's what I'm hoping we get here. And like I said, Fall 2019, get it, get it, get it, get it. I'll see you on the medieval battlefields. I will squash you as the Magyars or the Aztecs are my two main saves, but I'm looking forward to playing as the Tartars because to be honest I like playing the Huns and the Mongolians as well, they're like cool, I, I just like nomadic civilizations, they're really very interesting. But enough about history, enough about remasters and remakes and all that because that seems to be my theme for this year. Tengu, what is your top pick? Alright, so my top pick, there's not much to say, it's uh, Cyberpunk 2077. And it's been my most anticipated game since they or CD Projekt Red announced it six years ago. And I chose it as such at last year's E3, and it takes my top spot again this year. Uh, but now this time, we finally got a release date of April 16th, 2020. And as CD Projekt Red keeps working on it, it looks better and better. Like, I read that the scale of the game and the depth is pretty staggering with this year's E3 demo. And no wonder it's honestly taken them so long to make this. And the added surprise of having uh, Keanu Reeves <laughs> like as a character in the game is like <laughs> it's like icing on the cake. It was like it was uh, it was breathtaking to, to say the least. Uh, obviously, yeah. there'll be some there'll be like a new game in the top of my or in the top spot next year. But I'm just counting down days until I get my hands on this game, like along with hopefully a new computer under my wing. So. Dude, we did it. It's done. And we uh, did. yay! Congratulations. High five. Can we high five? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> All right. So uh, those are our five games that we're looking forward to after this year's E3. Some were already revealed. Oh, excuse me. Dear God. Uh, beforehand. Uh, but it's good to see another look at them. Turns out I enjoy Ubisoft games this year. So uh, overall, hey, they're they're a good. Yeah. <laughs> so overall, uh, thoughts? 
on E3? Anything you want to bring up? I think compared to the past few, it has been a stronger E3. Um, like, I think we kind of hit a very low point in the middle of this decade. Hey, it's actually the last E3 of this decade, by the oh, way. Oh, you're right, yeah. Um, but I think this year it's been stronger. And I know while at least two of my games have been just remasters and remakes and rehashing old territory, um, I do like to see that this year I think publishers are taking bigger steps. They are trying to get out there, trying to get out of this remake, remaster, safe zone, and now they're just kind of, you know, just remastering some safe titles, you know, just a, just a few, but not going overboard and just trying to cash in on nostalgia anymore. Um, but, I mean, the games you've mentioned are really opening my mind up to the possibilities gaming can take. Like, Watch Dogs Legions, I've never played a Watch Dogs game, just as a disclaimer, but, like, the idea of taking hold of any NPC and using them to dictate the story, that's next level, and I love that, and I hope it really does live up to its potential. Stuff you said in Breakpoint about the survival mechanics, they sound really good, they sound like they're, you know, this isn't just like random survival anymore, this is like realistic survival where there are proper trigger points of, you know, you get shot in your arm, therefore your arm ain't gonna work, and therefore you can't do your gunning properly, that's brilliant. Like even something that's that simple, but we couldn't achieve that twenty years ago. And now that like, I'm, now I'm that glad we can, adding those systems. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. I think this year we've seen games that definitely are more definitive of what next gen could be. So hopefully the ones that are coming out this year they round out this decade of gearing very well, and the ones coming out next year are taking us into a brave new world, a brave new decade, as we go into the 20s again, but this time without the Prohibition and the Mafia. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's going to be interesting, honestly, I think, to see what E3 2020 is going to be like, especially since Project Scarlet's going to be like, you know, just starting, and, you know, the PlayStation's probably going to be um, revealing their system as well. So yeah. we'll definitely be seeing what the developers are going to have cooked up for us just to make our gaming experience more immersive and i hope yeah it's awesome you know and um yeah you had some we, we talked about earlier but you had some concerns about like halo infinite i'd, I'd like um, to see what you had to say about yeah. that yeah i think it was just because my, my, my concerns just stem really just from how lacklustre Halo 5 was. Um, I remember playing the game shortly after it came out and the campaign just, it didn't work. Uh, bits of the story did, but I think it was just because the game tried so hard to be a four-player co-op ordeal, it just fell flat on it because like Master Chief had bloody three random Spartans he was dragging around who had a development of about zero. Osiris team, yeah, they were badly developed apart from their main dude. Yeah. Um, and I can't, I can't even remember his name, so that shows how well the game's bloody stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, it just didn't quite do it. It just felt felt stale in a way. But, like, with, with Halo Infinite, I, I do want to give Halo another chance. And, you know, since they're all coming to PC now with the Master Chief Collection... I'm going to be sat there reliving Reach, and Reach will always be my favourite Halo game, so basically that's the benchmark I'm setting. You've, you, you've got to be better than Reach to uh, be a, a great Halo game, so that, that's your challenge, Microsoft, or 343, not that I'm really in a position to be issuing challenges, <laughs> but, yeah. um, dude, like, I, I mean, I'll just say it on the internet now, I, I bloody cried at the end of Halo Reach, that final mission, because it's so powerful. It's okay, man, yeah, it was. Halo 6, you've got to do that. You've got to get some sort of emotion out of me apart from my usual bile. I agree with you with uh, Halo 5. I just, I honestly, I felt like I was just going from firefight to firefight and being like, oh, yeah. this this is cool. Let's smash through walls and just punch Yeah, and, and it was just like, yeah. hey, Covenant are here again. Yay. Yeah, I All mean, right. there, were, there were cool set I thought pieces. They were, I thought they were gone. <laughs> yeah. But I agree with you. It, it needs um, it needs that emotional like hook. Yeah. 
for it. So. Yeah, and it's it's rounding out the new trilogy, so you know trilogies have to have good endings. You know, this is your chance to have your Return of a Jedi, even though you kind of had it with Halo Three. So this is your chance to have uh, Revenge of a Sith. Yeah. So I, oh. hopefully, I, I just hope they learn from Halo Five and you know just put some story in there that'll make us yeah just be with Master Chief. Yeah. Instead of being like Cortana tries to dial 999 to get out of a bloody intergalactic police. Yeah. So. Because that's all it was. <laughs> yeah, let's hope it would have been good if. Got something. Would it, <laughs> yeah. it would have been good if the Guardians all just rocked up at the planet, was supposed to protect them, and go, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. So. I don't know. It. I, no, we don't yeah. live in such a world. <laughs> no. Um, I wanted to also chat about. Uh, <laughs> Jedi Fallen Order. That was yeah. yeah. Um, when I when I first saw it, I think it reminded me a little bit of The Force Unleashed. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you got that those vibes too. No, I I got those vibes very strongly. As okay. It um. I don't know. Like it didn't compl Like you were talking about it. Like it didn't completely like excite me. But I feel like there's like potential for it too. Like I think immediately already I kind of enjoyed the characters a little bit more. Like maybe I was just like in them more. Um, but I think I needed to see like more gameplay or like what else they had to offer. Yeah. Than what they showed, you know. Yeah, and I think it's just part of my lack of excitement. Is just I just again I I am a cynical person. And I think I just have a lot of cynicism and a lot of bones to pick with EA in general. You know, say we're saying like, oh, yeah. mate, bloody single player games, they don't work. And now they've just like gone back and said, yeah, single player games work for Star Wars. Yeah, going back to single players. It's like, yeah. It's funny too, because like Respawn's doing it and they're like, hey, yeah. mostly doing multiplayer games previously and stuff. Um, but, you know, actually, I read an article for Fallen Order and they said something like there's. I don't know if it was like a part in there from then on or if it was just like a certain part mm. but they they were playing a part where it, they said it felt more open and less linear yeah i i hope that is the case oh. because i think that yeah. i think now that you say that it does remind me that the core issue i had with watching the gameplay was it just felt very linear very scripted um like yeah. you know it, it like there were just some bits that were really set up and you know but you know i i, I get setting stuff up you know because you want a really good star wars game yeah i think so too so and i guess lastly you brought up empire of sin um did you ever play omerta hmm. i don't even mention this i think it was called the Morta city of gangsters or something like that it came out in 2012 i I remember playing the demo yeah. for it on my Xbox 360, uh -huh. and my memory of it is really patchy. I didn't um, like it. But <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Yeah. 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 Well, you didn't like it, and to be honest, while, while, while I just have a bad memory anyway, I do remember a good game, and I do remember a bad game. So therefore, if it's sitting in that patchy zone, it was probably not really that great a game or not that significant yeah. a game um just because i just end up remembering some random title from the very early 2000s <laughs> dude Gangsters i remember too. dude i remember that game Which... I, I, th there was a demo for that though i think if i'm not mistaken yes i i still have the pc gamer disc yeah. with that on and i remember it, i i enjoyed i enjoyed so... playing that i just never played like the full game Nah, nah, I, I always played the first mission and that was about as far as I could ever get, but that was because I was playing as an idiotic seven-year-old <laughs> who couldn't master yeah. it. I just said, yeah, just just, just go kill everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel care. like that's what happens when you're playing something when you're, like, super young. You just don't really understand it too well. Especially, I mean, it, I feel like at that point, a game like that is a little complicated for maybe somebody who's, like, six or seven. Yeah. But, I mean, it's good to yeah. go back. Wow, somebody just blew their nose. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but... Also, did you play uh, Godfather? Did you play I did. The Godfather? Um, I think on the PS2 or something? Um, it's 
probably sat on my extensive shelf yeah. of games. I feel like uh, you. I, I feel like that's something that you would yes, have. Yes, I, I can see it right in front of me. It, yeah, no, it is actually sat right in front of me. The Godfather. In fact, let's just grab that because it's in arms reach. Yes. Yeah, that's. Uh, yes. Welcome to the family. Join the car. Sorry, the... join the Corleones. And rise through the ranks to become the Don of Dons. Yes, it does look like a good game. It sat on that review list of things okay. to review. Um, I have seen okay. gameplay of it. It's a pretty good game. It's it's aged, yes, it has. but yeah. hey, it... the Godfather of the film. That thing doesn't age. That thing always no, is great. Doesn't. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I feel like um, Empire of Sin kind of, you know, using that same kind mm. of system. I feel like yeah. with, like the rackets and stuff, and I feel mm. like that would be really in depth and uh, I don't know, just fun to play. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> it it really does. And like with your picks as well, they do they do come across again. It's very strong. I know they're all pretty much Ubisoft, but <laughs> yeah. But say 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 what you want about Ubisoft, and I am someone who does have negative things to say about Ubisoft, but I have to respect how prolific they are at getting out massive titles um, and I am drawn to Watch Dogs Legion as well partially because it's set in Britain after post Brexit thing uh, for those of you who don't know yeah. right now the day of recording we don't know who our Prime Minister is going to be right now it's probably going to be Boris Johnson the man who kind of looks like your dude but is about as <laughs> I'd, I'd say he's slightly smarter, but okay. you, you, you know, you, you could count the difference in IQ on your fingers. Um, but not much room for uh, <laughs> um, in between there. But yeah, Watch Dogs Legion. I mean, I just still, I, I, I can't comprehend the scale we're getting with it. Um, and just, yeah, like, have you ever played Driver San Francisco? Yes, because that was that was the one where you could just go to any car. Yeah, or something, you could right? just project yourself into any yeah. car. That's kind of a vibe yeah. I get, but this is kind of like if Driver San Francisco was taken to the extreme yeah, and, and made cyberpunky. Yeah, it, like I said, like the the coding on that must have been like I don't, dude, I don't even know how they could have mm. like, just done something like yeah. that. And and when I said like. Each person has their own personality, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I, obviously, like, each character has their own archetypes or something. You know, hacker, melee person, and something else or whatever. Like, they're, like if everybody has their own dialogue, too, it's like, holy shit. If, <laughs> if like that's that. the case, I'm going to be massively impressed. Yeah. Like, I'm not expecting every yeah. individual person to have their own dialogue. But, yeah, me neither. like, if no. they have a very number of groups who have their own dialogue, then... I, I'm I'm just gonna be like, yeah, you know what? Mad respect to them. I'm probably not gonna get the game for a yeah. while because I've got two other Watch Dogs games to play at first. But I have to say, <laughs> yeah. just from the pitch, it does command a lot of respect from me. Just just for you know taking on that level of ambition. Yeah, exactly. That was. I don't know. Yeah. Like, hopefully, it turns out to be you know how they how they want it. Yeah. Because. Yeah. You know, I'm still tempering my expectations, though. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Expectations always have to be managed because game producers do tend to promise you the world, and there are yeah. quite a few that fall short. Um, so I think that's another good thing to say. Your, your games that you've mentioned are really ambitious. I mean, we, I, I bet you would actually be heartbroken if cyberpunk doesn't live up but i know i know it's <laughs> yeah. already in pretty safe hands with cd project red they are a team who self-taught themselves programming just to make the witcher one and that stuff came out like bloody gold and then it, they just kept getting better um yeah and they like improved on it too yeah. especially after their first version yeah. wasn't really that good yeah so i mean just as a hypothetical question, like, out of all the games, which one would you be the most disappointed if it didn't live up to the expectations that have been set at this presentation? 
I, it like it, it have to be cyberpunk because I mean cyberpunk I love cyberpunk just in terms of like a genre yeah. and when CD Projekt Red said they were tackling it I was like oh man it's like especially coming after the Witcher and everything and how they do storytelling mission design like level design and everything it's uh I mean it's six years in the pot and that's and being that long for me to like to anticipate it and it ends up being like not that good that's that'll hit the gut pretty good mm. um so but i you know like i feel like like you said i feel like i'm in good hands and i feel like they've been just you know working on that game like non-stop almost and uh if anything maybe Keanu reeves can <laughs> like, yeah he like help him out or he's something. He's everywhere again. It's Keanu, but uh, yeah, he, he, uh, you, you can't hit Keanu. Um, no. Just going to mention Keanu's, Keanu's one not. game neither of us mentioned, but probably because it didn't even turn up. Uh, Mountain Blade Bannerlord. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Shit. Oh, yeah, well. Was that even Eddie? No, <laughs> no. I just wanted to. I, I just I wanted to say Mountain Blade Bannerlord at some point in the video, and I have. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh well. We said this last year. One day. I think. One day. We're, we're, we're still taking yeah. bets if it's going to be about our Halo 3, which is already. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We're, we're still taking bets if it's going to be about our Half Life 3 coming out first. Um, but Valve's too busy remodeling the entire Steam library, so. Um, ball still in your cart, yeah, Tailwords. Yeah, well, man. I mean, at least they're, you know, doing dev blogs, keeping us updated, I guess. But Yeah. Executions I, I, have been I, announced. I think we, yeah. <laughs> you know, I like how they're just, like, giving us, like, little, like, crumbles of stuff there. Hmm. Here and there. Sometimes I wish they would maybe, like, you know, put all the features together. Yeah. And just come out but, with a devlog yeah. with, like, all this stuff. But still fitting in with this theme that we seem to have picked up on. It's another game that is just trying to command such mighty scale. Such mighty promises. Yeah. I, I think that is a game where I will genuinely be heartbroken if it does not live up. Yeah. But I'll yeah. be heartbroken if it just never comes out as well, so... Um, <laughs> don't let me down on this one, Tail Like, after all these years, they just cancel it? Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's hope they just don't cancel it. A lot yeah. of people would be... Yeah. Um, um, that's, that's number one on my Steam list, man. It is. <laughs> it is. Um...